Andy, great you can join us. Thank you. Chris, absolute pleasure. It's nice to be here. Yes, we were just having a chat and um, it's always the way on the podcast. It, it, my guests are always so, you know, we share things in common, people that have done stuff in this life, I suppose. And yeah, and out, out of that sharedness comes great. Co- oh, there's my phone going off. Sorry. Out of that, out of that sharedness comes great conversation. And uh, sometimes I forget to push record on the podcast. <laughs> I think I've lost all that, but that's gone from history now. So my gosh, we hooked up on LinkedIn. We did. And I'm very fortunate that I meet people through LinkedIn that have such rich histories and experiences as yours, Andy. Um, Red Arrows, now a, a commercial airline pilot. Anyone who grew up of my era remembers watching Airplane, and, and which was a spoof <laughs> on all the um, jumbo jet movies of the 70s and, and early 80s. And obviously, I think pretty much most of us have been on a 747 or a or a or a, or a big a big aircraft. And, yeah, yeah. And I have I probably have a million questions to ask just based on what I've just said. So <laughs> fire away, Chris. Well, where do we start? Um, how did you get into flying? Well, of course, that's a, that's a great question, isn't it? And um, one which I've been asked many times. It's something I wanted to do, you know, from a very young age. And as far back as I can remember, when I was at primary school, we went on a, a school trip. So I must have been about, I don't know, eight or nine. Never been flying before, never been abroad before. Um, I was brought up in North Wales and we went on a school trip to Liverpool Airport, Speak Airport as it was known then. And we, uh, my class had a flight in a Viscount, which was a um, small airliner, propeller driven aircraft. And we flew along the North Wales coast. Um, And I just remember being totally fascinated by being able to look down and see areas that I knew from the air. It was just totally fascinating. And I think that sowed the seed in the mind of an eight year old boy. And from then on, I was I was hooked, really. And I, you know, joined the Air Cadets, um, which gave me a chance to actually fly. Um, and sort of engendered my interest in aviation throughout my time at school. Um, and um, I was lucky enough to be selected by the Air Force. Um, well, I went for some tests at age 16, and then I was accepted at 17. So when I left school after my A-levels, I was um, lucky enough to join the Air Force and start um, start pilot training. So that's it in a nutshell. It goes back to the age of eight. Most of my guests, including myself, not that I'm my guest, but including <laughs> myself, uh, we we were all rejected by the RAF, so we joined the the other the, the rest of the military. Um, it's amazing. All the SAS guys I speak to all say that I tried to get in the RAF when I left school, but they wouldn't have me. Very high standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think we're both friends with Tim Tim Davies, aren't we? Yes, yes. Very lovely, lovely man. Um, we've become firm friends through this this podcast in business. And, yeah. And um, yeah, you, it, following Tim, it really brings it home to you. The kind of attitudes that are, are in play in this arena. Um, yeah. I've heard talk of snobbery and, and, and this sort of thing. So how was it for you getting through the recruiting process into into the air force mm. it was um it's an interesting one because i think i look back on it now and i was uh, i was pretty young and naive i think because i'd come from being i suppose a fairly a fairly big fish in a small pond you know in school and perhaps in the air cadets to being nothing um and i was very naive but because I'd come straight from school, I think it was, I was still quite adaptable. Um, I'd come into a, an institution, if you like, from one to the other. So although it was really a very steep learning curve at, at the beginning, the interview process and the first few months, I, I found it okay. Hard work, but okay, because I think I was still adaptable. And as I say, you know, still naive at, at age, well, 17, 18. 
Yeah, I've seen comments online of some of the questions that people have been asked before they were rejected and it, it they're so subjective, <laughs> you know. Really difficult, yeah. You could yeah. really imagine that to that instructor or to that um, got RAF guy in the recruiting office, this was like, you know, how many air shows have you been to? That that was a you know, his yeah. his way of marking it. Yeah. Um they look at, you know, they do look at that. Obviously, they want you to be interested in aircraft and they'll ask you some, some specific things about the Air Force, how many squadrons it has, that sort of thing. But also current affairs. Uh, I think it was more of a, you're just getting a picture of the individual. So, yes, you've got to be interested in aviation, obviously. But is he interested in anything else? And, of course, one of the big things they, they talk about is team skills. Um, and is this guy going to be part of, you know, is he going to be a good member of a team? And subsequently, you know, maybe a good a good leader, uh, and as, and so they really concentrate. I remember this because I used to play a lot of rugby, being brought up in North Wales, and they really, really pushed on the, on the team stuff. Um, very interested in in what you did at school as part of a team. So, and uh, and you know, I look back on that, and actually, it's true. Throughout my Air Force life, on a squadron, you're part of a team, part of a small team, and even now, you know, the sort of flying I do on an airliner you've got a small team a cohesive team in the cockpit so um so i look back and think actually that was a really relevant a really relevant question mm. i guess um it doesn't factor in though that you can have awful people in a team <laughs> that's very true and you probably know that you know you get somebody like that it really brings the team down doesn't it yeah i've got a you've done you do quite a bit of speaking don't you i do yes i do i use I use the red arrows as a template for team skills mm. and an excellence and also talk about leadership as well. So, and the, we can talk about it later if you like, but the red arrow selection procedure is, is quite interesting. And the idea of course, is to try and weed out those people that we don't want who are going to bring the team down. Yes. The reason I mention it is I've been asked to do a speech at the end of this month. And one of the subjects is, is teamwork which I'm guessing for a lot of sort of people in the commercial sector is it, it's just a buzzword that probably isn't really well understood because um, there's so many different dynamics going on in a team, aren't there? And not all of them are very pleasant when you're in the military. Yeah. yeah. Um, my experience was I took a team of people fundraising in Scandinavia when we were going to work in Africa yeah. So we were going to go and work in sub-Saharan Africa. I was going to Mozambique to become basically school teachers down there. And we had to fundraise money on the streets of Scandinavia by selling postcards. Um, might sound a bit bizarre, folks, but it's just what what we what we did. And, <laughs> and the way I saw the team, because I was so I the first day I did it, I almost took myself away and sat down and thought, I can't do this. When you approach 10 strangers and they all go yeah. like that and walk straight past you, it's it's a tough learning curve, right? And you've got to have your wits about you to be able to, you know, put this in frame and see that it's nothing to do with you, right? So when I when I sussed that, then I sussed a method that I could pretty much approach anyone and they couldn't leave me. They had to they had to say something to me and I would quite cleverly given four options all of which meant either give give me all the money or just just give me a little at least give <laughs> yeah. me a donation or you're gonna look like a massive <laughs> you know what right <laughs> so i i'm using that system plus the fact that like a like an oyster fisherman you know you've got to get a hundred to get the one you know to get the pearl you've got to open a hundred oysters right so mm -hmm. i just used that principle so i didn't take it personally got so good they made me a team leader to take a team around around Finland of all places wonderful country hello hello Finland um and what I realized is you get people that just pick the ball up and run with it they're fine if anything they just need a bit of sort of guidance of not 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 to go too 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 bonsai yeah then you get the people that they're up for it they're just maybe not their skills aren't quite good so you need to put something in there then you get the people that they just feel they can't do it 
and my idea is in that dynamic they're the people that you need to spend your time with yeah and what i did andy is is we had targets at the end of the day every student had to hit let's say 300 pounds worth of postcards selling and so i got the team together and went right we're a team the true meaning of the team is we put all our money in the same pot right and just mm-hmm. so long as the people that are struck that you know that a struggle <clears throat> as long as you don't disappear and take yourself off to a to a cafe um we'll divide that money at the end of the day and just a simple thing like that gave everybody um you know well recognition yeah for their Very efforts important. yeah it gave them encouragement and it gave them a goal so long as they stay here chris is going to split this money up and we're all going to go to africa and yeah Sorry, I got gone on a bit there, but no, I know because you, I was listening very carefully because you touched on a lot of the values that I talk about as well. You know, giving people a goal, making people feel inclusive. It's really important, isn't it? Yeah. I'll give you a couple of um, examples of some of the things I talk about. Um, one of them is admitting your mistakes and people are quite reluctant to do that, particularly in business. So when we learn from a Red Arrows um, a practice or even a display every display that we uh, that we do is videoed is filmed so that we can look at it and you know critique each other but the first thing the leader does is stand up in front of the team and he admits the mistakes that he's just made and that sends a powerful message doesn't it well two messages really one um it's okay to make mistakes uh but more importantly it's it's okay to talk about them so uh, and that sends a message to the rest of the team uh, and they're, they're not afraid to say, yeah, I did this wrong, I did that wrong. Um, and it's not all about um, what went wrong. I, I look at sort of a debrief like that, a team collective, whatever you want to call it, a wash up. You can say that went really well, guys. What did we do right this time to make it go so well? So I really concentrate on that. We call it the debrief in the military, don't we? But it's called many things. But uh, And um, a lot of businesses I talk to are really surprise they don't have wash-ups they don't get it together at the end of the week or every fortnight and talk about things and i think it's a massively important thing to to get together and discuss it's the only way you can improve is talk about things that went well things that didn't go well and then you know come up with a plan just like you did to change things and make it better yeah we're in funny times i think we said this earlier the the way culture certainly in commerce or in business is going it it's really not good i mean now it's become de rigueur to get hold of stuff finally get hold of the person you've been trying to get hold of for for my recent case it's been six months right oh yeah hi chris yeah got your email but uh, your phone number was wrong and you're like oh really Mm. You know, that that doesn't wash with people that have been in, you know, situations where your decision making is life and death. Yeah. You know, and you got you got to own it. <clears throat> pretending that yes. you didn't, you know, not replying to an email uh, or then saying it's because someone's phone. It, it's we've become that sort of culture, haven't we? We have. No, you're right. And it's a shame. And it's those people who've been able to adapt in these strange times, I think, that will do well once it's all over. Yeah, it rewards bad personalities, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very true. Gosh, I guess we should get back to, to, to flying. But thank you. I've got my speech worked out for the end of the month now. There you go. Talk about debriefing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know where to begin. So when you you went to the recruiting office, what what position did, were you going for and did you get your first sort of choice? Well, one of the things they ask you there is that you, you apply as a pilot. And I remember this quite clearly. So they said, well, what would you do if, if you failed? You know, would you accept a position as a navigator or air traffic controller? And... I didn't want that. I just wanted to be a pilot. So my answer was that um, if I didn't get in this time, I'd try again. And if I didn't get in as a pilot in the Air Force, I'd go and try and be a pilot somewhere else. Um, and I was really 
just totally fixated on that. And I remember thinking, I hadn't really got a plan B. I'd got a few offers from university, but I didn't really know what I was going to do at university. I just wanted to fly. So I think, you know, you have to have that, that sort of burning desire to go and do something. And I remember I did, did have that at a very, uh, a very young age. So um, in answer to your question, yeah, it was position as a pilot and that was it. It was the be all and end all for me. That's all I wanted to do. Wow. You sound like a man after my own own heart <laughs> when i decide on something it's like no it's that or nothing else yeah absolutely it's, it's awful when i buy stuff because i just look at the best item and it's <laughs> usually ridiculously expensive yeah and this item, have... if it's a pair of running shoes or something it's like these tesco turbos will do just as well <laughs> but i've got to have the 400 quid ones <laughs> <laughs> Were you, um, had you your, your private licence when you joined? Yes, interestingly, through the Air Cadets, actually, I was given, a, they call it flying scholarship. So effectively, they pay for a number of hours for you to do some private flying. And I managed to get my private pilot's licence before I got my driving licence. So I was 17, I think. And um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was great. They sent, sent me off to Leicester Aero Club for the summer. And uh, I did, I think it was about 40 hours flying. And of course, this was amazing for, for this young lad. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I carried on. I flew my friends and my family um, for, for quite a few years, really. Just held my private pilot's license. And then it all became too difficult to try and keep that going as well as the Air Force flying. But um, yes, it, I did. I did get my private pilot's license. What's your opinion then of... Um the FAA versus the CAA. So Civil Aviation Authority being the UK, yes. FAA being America. The reason I ask is I got my license in America. Uh, I passed my test within, I think, three and a half weeks. And that that yeah. was learning every single day, I think, I think including Sundays. But it's still a very short time to be able, and, and it's not, you don't sort of cut corners or anything. It's just you get a lot more flying time in America because yeah. the weather windows are so predictable. Yes. You know, I was in Florida. It's going to be brilliant sunshine all day long. Come five o'clock, guaranteed, you get these massive cloud heads start, start building, and then down comes yeah. the rain. Yeah. Whereas the UK, I understand the, the weather can, can really have an effect. Um, uh, on how many hours flying, you know, how often you can get up. Mm. And our airspace is a lot more crowded as well, isn't it? It is. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there, really, because it is a smaller country, obviously. We have some pretty awful weather, don't we? And the airspace is quite tight, you know. We've got zones around all the major airports. Um, we've got airways that crisscross the country. So... In terms of rules and regulations, we have to be fairly, fairly strict. Uh, but it's the weather, I think, that's the dictator there, Chris. As you said, you know, I've got friends and colleagues who've done military training in America and um, they fly every day in beautiful weather. Um, and then they come back to the UK or to anywhere in Europe and they get they're quite surprised that, you know, it's really restrictive and it's hard work when the weather's bad. So I think the weather is, is the major difference between doing your your license in the UK and, and perhaps in the, in the States. Yeah. Do you think there's st the, the, do you think the standards are, are different? I mean, British not trying to sound like, you know, Anglo centric here or anything, but <laughs> we, we do kind of do things the proper way, don't we? It's yeah. just, it, it's, I mean, for example, if you go to Thailand, it's not unusual. You see five people on a motorbike. That's the whole family, including a baby under one arm and no helmets or anything. Maybe it's changed now. I was first in Thailand like 20 odd years ago. But and I mean, that sort of stuff doesn't wash here, does it? No, no, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I think that there's nothing wrong with doing your license in America, but I do think um, it, we're probably slightly more rule bound here for a good reason. So it is slightly more difficult, more involved. Um, um, but as I say, nothing wrong with an FAA license either. 
No, and the thing I like about my license is is, is it's for life, whereas yes. the UK one is only is it for three years or something? Yes, yes, and you have to you know do do a certain amount of flying each year, which I'm sure you do in America as well, just to keep that license um, valid. Yeah. Well, in America, you can let it go fallow. So let's say ten years. Yeah. And then you can rock up at a, an airstrip, go into the flying school. Um, they'll take you on a check test. As long as you can demonstrate, which I doubt you would after a 10 year layoff, but but <laughs> technically, as long as you can demonstrate, you can fly the aircraft um, safely and, and handle the radio procedure. Yeah, you're 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 good to go again. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> I've been. Uh, ticked off by air traffic control in america it's it, it on the one hand it's really safe andy isn't it but on the other hand it's bloody dangerous up there yeah yeah they use these aircraft in in america because it's such a big country like the, we use cars really in many ways and you can just there's so many little airfields around which is great but you can just hop in and fly fly around um and a lot of the time it's it's free airspace but you know even my airline, I'm going into New York or Boston or somewhere like that, you'll have dozens of little airplanes underneath you flying around. So, yeah, it's 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 slightly freer, I would say, over there. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. When did you last fly? Is it fairly recently? No, I, I'm. I'm a bit of a bucket list person. Andy, right. And I don't mean that's no disrespect to myself. I just I want to do everything in this life. Right. Yeah. I don't necessarily have the money to follow it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to dive off the cliff in Acapulco like Elvis did in the movie when I was six, you know. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to um, live in the Amazon jungle and catch piranhas like I read about in the books as a child, right? That's why I talk a lot about about for, for our friends at home as well. I'm always talking about read books, you know, it, it enrich your life. Absolutely. Um, I watched the film Point Break back in the, the original Point Break. I think it's mm. back in the 90s. And when I saw what skydiving was, that you can just chuck a parachute on and throw yourself out of a plane and then fall for a, over a minute before pulling your chute. I want to do that, right? <laughs> this is just how my brain yeah. works. And I've yeah. also got this thing where I never say never. If I want to do something, I'd never consider that I might not be able to do it. For me, yeah. it's always a challenge waiting to happen, right? I agree um, with that. My two, the only two sort of, I've had to extend my bucket list now because I meet such amazing people. <laughs> so I chatted to Nims Dye, the Gurkha stroke SBS legend the other day who climbed all 14 of the world's highest peaks wow. in under, under six months, breaking, taking seven years off the record. And I'd love to climb Everest. I've got all the books on my shelf here. Me too. That's something. <laughs> Me too. And I'd like to um, ski to the South Pole. I'd like to do more than that, actually, but <laughs> I've got to, got to have some acknowledgement of your limitations it's, and it's you have ambition though chris isn't it it's good to have goals and dreams absolutely yeah and i think as a kid who didn't look up in the sky at an airplane and think i wonder what it's like to fly that at least i did maybe that's not normal but i just thought god wouldn't that be great and for some reason no i'll tell you what it was when I did my first skydive, which was in New Zealand, a place called Lake Taupo, um, it was the first part, I should say, of the AFF advanced freefall course. So I did my very first part in New Zealand. And the, one of the girls that was on the plane with me, we got chatting and she was a pilot. She was English and she was a pilot. And I'm just talk to me <laughs> tell me everything <laughs> yeah I, I want to know this is just what i'm like you know i want to know everything what's yeah. it like taking off is it scary landing how do you work the radio what and and that just kind of rekindled that thought that i had as a kid that, that what's it like to fly a plane and then at the next sort of or when the opportunity arose i had a few quid in the bank 
Um, I just bought myself an aircraft magazine, looked at the back, the advertising pages in the back, and there was a flight school. Price looked okay. It was in Florida. That was it. So don't do it. So sorry, a bit long winded again. But to answer your question, Andy, it was I. I did it. I think in two thousand and five. Okay. And I'm just more than happy to. You know, if if yeah. I get a bit of money in the bank in the future, I'll undoubtedly go and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm just absolutely privileged to be a to have my little experience of the aviation uh, it, community it does get into your blood that's for sure i mean it's been my my life um i've, I've had a flying license for over 40 years now chris i know i, I know i don't look that old but i have and uh, I you uh, older. <laughs> <laughs> no 40 years and you think wow and uh, you know military commercial um yeah so it does get into your blood and it's something that um you know, it's, it's made me who I am, given me what I've got. It's, it's been fantastic, really. Let's get into the nitty gritty then, because mm. um, what, what, what was your first apparatus in the RAF then? Is that the right word or am I just making that up? <laughs> Sounds like a chemistry experiment, <laughs> doesn't it? But I know what you mean. No, um, it, it's, <clears throat> I should say it's that. You know that film, Catch Me If You Can, with Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio, yeah, do, yeah. where he pretends to be an airline pilot and flies around the country as a pretend pilot. Yeah. And he learns <laughs> that one of the things the pilots say is, what, what apparatus are you yeah. on? And it, and it means, what are <laughs> <Yeah>. you flying? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, first apparatus was the, uh, well, after flying training, I did the flying training on uh, Jet Provost, which is no longer in service, and a lovely airplane called the Hawk which is the aircraft the Red Arrows flies, great little uh, airplane. Um, and those are the two sort of training aircraft. And from there, you go to the, to the front line. And my front line airplane was an airplane called the Lightning, which is an amazing, amazing piece of uh, engineering. It was designed and built in the, in the 50s, the late 50s. Um, and it served for about 30 years. It, it came out of service in 1988. So I was lucky to fly it in the latter stages of its life, really. But this thing was a single seat um, fighter. Its job was to intercept intruding aircraft, anybody uh, intruding into UK airspace. Didn't have a great range really in terms of, of how long it could fly, but it was phenomenally fast and very, very powerful. It could fly in excess of 50,000 feet, twice the speed of sound, uh, just had one seat. It was just me sat there in this monster of an airplane. So I was really privilege to to have flown um, the lightning it was just a fantastic experience hard work uh, you've got a little radar that you have to operate as well as fly the airplane at the same time um, to get you behind the enemy aircraft and then you would in theory shoot your uh, missile or your gun if it came to that but um, luckily you know I never had to so I flew flew the thing for four years it was phenomenal really really good uh, experience so yeah, that was my first apparatus, the the lightning. <laughs> apparatus. It's just our word now. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's the, <laughs> All the, the other word. pilots yeah. are going, what That's the it. what are they talking about? What the hell? <laughs> and was that was that a jet or was that a propeller? Yeah, it's uh, it's a jet. So it's quite an unusual looking airplane. It has two big jet engines, but one on top of the other, so not uh, not on the wing. So uh, you're effectively sitting on the. Um, on top of these two big Rolls-Royce engines with very highly swept wings. Um, I don't know if you can see behind me, actually, there's a picture on my wall, um, just over my right shoulder. Mm. That's um, that's a lightning there. It's probably a little bit too far away for you to see, but um, yeah, it was just an incredible airplane. Um, and as I say, quite iconic, really. So it was a real privilege. I look back on it now at, at what a privilege it was to have flown it. It's, it's fantastic. Are they still in service? No, I went out of service quite a while ago, uh, late 80s, and it was replaced by the Tornado and subsequently by the Typhoon. So the Typhoon now is the equivalent of the Lightning in the early 80s. But wow. similar performance, technology has obviously moved on a lot, but uh, performance-wise, it was a great airplane. So was, was that a bomber then? No, it was, um, I suppose you'd describe it as an, an air defence fighter. So it didn't carry bombs, it carried missiles and guns to shoot down other aircraft um and we left the bombing to to uh, other aircraft types like the harrier the jaguar 
uh, they would do the the bombing and we'd go and shoot down we were their top cover effectively because mm. that's the uh, the mistake a lot of people make when i spoke to tim he enlightened me to the fact that a tornado or at least in that role isn't a fighter jet it's a, yeah um it's quite surprising yeah yeah and then when you think back to the um the gulf war stories was it john john and john who got shot down you john's absolutely yeah, yeah. And, and obviously so they became they, quite vulnerable, you know, they're in, they're in a, a bomber rather than a fighter. So they are quite vulnerable when they're doing their, their bombing run. Um, quite, um, yeah, quite vulnerable to attack. And what did you move on to from, from then? Well, from the Lightning, I did, um, I don't know how it works in the Army and, and the Marines and so on, but we tend to do tours of about four years, three or four years. So I did four years on the Lightning. And then... Um, Oh, sorry, this, my phone's going off now. I, I moved to become a flying instructor uh, on the Hawk uh, at a place called RAF Valley in Anglesey. So um, it was the Hawk that the Red Arrows, uh, the aircraft the Red Arrows fly. So I was teaching student pilots now who are coming through the system. I've just done it myself, so it's gone full circle. And it was something I didn't want to do to start with. Um, I wanted to stay flying the lightning. They said, no, you, your time's come. You've got to go and be an instructor. But I, I think it probably did me the world of good. It was, um, the flying was, was great. I had to be able to do the flying to be able to, to teach it. And it gave me a qualification. And I think it made me uh, far more self-critical than I had been. Um, because you had to demonstrate something to the student in order for him to be able to, to copy you uh, and to do it. So it was good flying. I met loads of guys going through the courses and made lots of lots of friends. Um, and I did that for four years. And it was that really that led me onto um, onto my next job, which was which the Red Arrows. It was um, the introduction through flying the Hawk at Valley, going to various air shows, meeting the Red Arrows. And I thought, perhaps this is something that I actually could do. Um, and in terms of experience, I'm kind of in that bracket now. So, so it was a really good job. I did go instructing in the end. It was a good step. Red Arrows is kind of the cream of the cream for an RAF fast jet pilot, is it not? Well, it is. I think it's, um, it's something that I would say most people would love to do. Not everybody. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But yeah, I think it's something that if you asked any fast jet pilot in the RAF, would they like to join the Red Arrows? I'm sure the answer would be yes. Uh, it, it certainly was the pinnacle of my flying. It's the best flying I've ever done. Um, and um, yeah, we, we can talk a little bit more about it really, but it was, yeah, it was a phenomenal three years. Mm. How is it fitting into such a, a, a tight, a small, tight-knit professional community who have a lot of tradition and, and, and also, you know, they want things to be to, to be right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the selection, if you like, Chris, because people do find that quite quite interesting. So, for every every year, the team of nine pilots they change three, so it's a third of the team change every year. And for those three places, we probably get about fifty or sixty applicants for people who are eligible. In other words, they've got the required background and experience. Um, They've got good write-ups from their current boss um, and they're in a position where they're, they're able to go. So there are three, three criteria there, really. And then out of those 50 or 60 pilots, the team themselves, the nine guys, will sit around a room and discuss them. And they'll whittle that, that list down to nine. And the reason it's nine is because we can invite, invite them over. They can all fly in the back seats. Um, and over the period of a week, they'll go through um, a formal interview um, a flying test, um, but most importantly, and I think you'll appreciate this, you're getting to know the individuals. So during that week, you'll chat to them in the crew room, we'll go down the pub and have a few beers, and you get to see what they're like as an individual and whether they're going to fit into your team. So you've then got some indicators, you've got your results of your flying test, um, you've got the results of the formal interview, but most importantly, are they going to fit in as part of the team? They'll fly in the back seat so they can see what it's like to be a member of the Red Arrows. And then at the end of the week, we'll all sit back down again together. And from that, that, that list of nine, we'll come up with, uh, with three. 
And it's often really close by virtue of the fact they're there. They could probably all do the job. Mm. Um, so it's a really difficult choice. And sometimes it comes down to a vote. Mm. But that's how it works. So we're effectively picking who we're going to be working with for the next few years. And um, it's worked well over over 50 years now. The Red Arrows have been going and it's and it's generally worked well, really well. So I'm guessing a lot, a big part of that selection is the bit in the pub. Definitely. Definitely, because you want somebody who's going to put the needs of the team ahead of the needs of themselves. So I'll give you an example. So at the end of a, a long day, uh, you've done two or three flights, you're really tired. All you want to do is go to the pub and have a beer. And, um, you know, somebody says, we've got to go and meet the mayor or sign some brochures for somebody. And you want somebody who's going to be quite happy to do that rather than than have a moan and, and disappear off. So so there is, you know, there are lots of things that, that happen outside the flying um and we need the sort of people who are going to going to join in and are not going to be bothered by that sort of thing mm. and they're really well received the red arrows aren't they wherever they go uh i've seen them from my house window here just flying out over the over the sea yeah um i've been driving to air shows and they, they've flown past and it's Stop the car. There's the Red Arrows. <laughs> I think it's part of British culture now, isn't it? A bit like Concord was or, you know, it's, it's part of our heritage now. And I think, um, well, we do when we're flying around the UK and or abroad, we're effectively selling UK PLC. So, yes, we're representing the we're representing the RAF, we're representing the armed forces, but we're also representing something that I think is truly iconically British, don't you? Mm. It must be a bit nice everywhere you go. You are st stealing the show, aren't you? Well, I like to think so. It's quite interesting when you go in and there's perhaps one of the American teams or one of the European teams. So there's always a little bit of friendly competition and you're looking at each other to see if you can perhaps pinch any manoeuvres that they do. So it's a healthy competition. But um, yeah, we do pride ourselves, I suppose, on, on striving for excellence every time. Mm. And any well i was gonna say any near misses but i mean you've you've had fatalities in in the red arrows haven't you yeah they've been you know if you put yourself in an airplane and turn it upside down close to the ground with nine other aircraft it's it's you know it's dangerous business and we try to mitigate that by training obviously six months of the year is spent training and i'm sure in your in your jobs in the military it's all training isn't it um, but of course, it's still a dangerous job. And um, for various factors, whether it's human error, mechanical error, weather, um, things are going to happen. So over the period of 50 odd years, there have been a few accidents. But when you consider what we're doing, it's actually relatively few, relatively few. Um, and certainly during my three years, we, we were lucky enough not to have any. Um, but, uh, you know, in any walk of life, Chris, I think this is, is going to happen. The only way to... Not to have that happen to you would be to sit at home, wouldn't it? And wrap yourself in cotton wool, which I know yeah. you and I, we're not, uh, we're not going to do that. Well, it's undoubtedly, you know, if you're going to go, go, go in a red arrow. <laughs> you're going to, going to check out of this world. It's not a bad way to go, is it? Go doing something you love. Yes. But the, the thing that's coming into my mind though, is I've seen, um, when you get the disaster, when you get the fatality, but it's a disaster at an air show. And um, I don't know if that's happened to the Red Arrows, but there's certainly, it, it, you're probably familiar with this. In the States, you get these sometimes quite aging aircraft. Yes. They're hugely kind of um, customized. So they're, they're all upgraded. But then you get one rivet that's still from like 1955. Yeah, that rivet's going like this over you know the best part of 50, 50, 60 years. And when it goes and that aircraft, you know, comes down on the crowd or whatever, it's... Um... Yeah. They've mitigated it over the years. I mean, there have been accidents where, um, you know, people in the crowd have sadly been, been killed. And um, the way they've mitigated it now is to stop any sort of crossing manoeuvres towards the crowd so any velocity vector towards the crowd has been stopped so it's i think it's as safe as, as it's going to be now um but you know people love going to see airplanes air shows the noise the smell of the jet engines i don't think we're going to stop air shows at all 
Um, and, I, and we've just got to make it as safe as we can. So when you're out on the town then and you're trying to, um, let's say, uh, attract members of the opposite, well, or members of the same <laughs> sex, you know, whatever your thing is, do, do you say that you're a Red Arrow pilot or do you say you're, you're a Royal Marine? Of course I say I'm a Royal Marine, obviously. <laughs> I knew it. No, we're, we're, I think we're both too modest, aren't we? <laughs> we could say I say I'm in aluminium tubing or something like that, you know. <laughs> Is that a thing though in, in the Marines, the guys, I don't know why, but guys will go out and they would say they're brickies. <laughs> yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think, I, I'd never go out and say I'm a Red Arrows pilot. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. What's, um, what's the kind of silliest thing that a, a civilian's ever said to you? Have you got some sort of preconceived ideas or? There's always the usual questions on, you know, uh, uh, and kids, always ask, you know, have you ever been in a crash? They always ask you that, have you ever had a crash? It's something that kids really love because I do talks to schools and things. It's, you know, how fast does it go? How high does it go? And have you had, ever had a crash? But um, I always, as, as you do when you do a talk, I always invite questions at the end. Uh, and people honestly come up with some brilliant questions. Mm -hmm. Questions that I've, I love answering questions because hopefully I know a little bit more about it than they do. But sometimes I come up with great questions. Um, and I love that bit, interacting with um, with the public, uh, particularly after a tour. Um, it's great, really, really good. When people ask me questions, I think, what are they asking me for? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm supposed to know, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Got that imposter syndrome thing. Yeah, well, well, you've done that. It is funny. You, I guess there is a little bit of that, but um, there is always an answer in there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. 747s then that's mm. that's something else again because when you leave the royal air force are, are you technically you're not a commercial pilot are you you're you're a military pilot yeah with, with a private pilot's license i don't know what do they do they add the jet function to the no it's um it's quite a lengthy, lengthy process, Chris, actually. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. So my experience was all fast jet, Lightning's Hawks, which has got nothing to do with flying 747. So what you have to do is upgrade that PPL, that private pilot's license, into what's called an ATPL, which you've probably heard of, Airline Transport Pilot's License. So it involves a load of exams, aerodynamics, electrics, all the usual stuff. Um, and I had to do an instrument rating as well on a small twin engined airplane called an Aztec. It's just a light airplane effectively, but I'd never flown one before. So this was quite difficult. And then with that license and your background, you have to have the license really before applying to any airline. So once you've got that license, you can then go out and look for jobs. And I left the Air Force in 1998. It's a difficult decision, you know, because I really enjoyed it, but I think had I stayed on and made a career of it, you spend less and less time flying and more time sat behind a desk. It's the same in the Marines, isn't it? If you stay in, that's what tends to happen. It's less front line, it's more office. And I just didn't fancy that. So quite a few of my friends had joined the airlines and I thought, it sounds pretty good. Obviously the flying's not going to be quite as exciting, but certainly as a lifestyle, great. And I still get to fly. So um, so I wrote to to, British Airways, Virgin, all the big airlines in the sort of late 80s. And I was lucky enough to be accepted by, well, I was accepted by by both. And I picked a BA and joined BA in 19, uh, 1998. So with my little airline transport pilot's license. So I went from a Hawk through the Aztec doing my instrument rating to the 747, which was quite a big step. My gosh. And BA and uh, Virgin were quite rivals back in the day, weren't they? They were. Well, they were, I suppose they still are in a way, you know, competing for transatlantic routes and things. So uh, competition's good, though, isn't it? Yeah, I think it, it might have been Richard Branson's biography that I read that the chairman of BA said, I'll never enter negotiation with anyone that doesn't wear a tie. <laughs> And of course, Richard Branson's response as well, you, you should have done. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, been fierce rivals, I think, for years. Yes, yes. 
I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm not too happy with uh, Mr. Branson at the minute. He's, um, his healthcare companies have been going into primary schools. Um, that's a whole nother thing again, but I think a lot of people know, know what I'm on about. Yeah. Um, Andy, yeah, amazing. I'm the guy when I'm sat on the, um, when I'm on an international flight, I'm hoping that the stewardess is going to say, can anyone fly a plane? And <laughs> I'll get my five minutes of fame <laughs> crash, crashing it into the ground. But um, yeah, I just find the whole thing yeah. fascinating. It's a shame, isn't it? Because, you know, the last six months or so has really devastated the, the industry, particularly the, the airline industry, flying passengers around. People are not, they're not flying. And so... You know, hundreds of my colleagues worldwide have been grounded. They've lost their jobs. It's a really tough time for, for the aviation industry. Um, so much so that um, I've, I've moved on, actually. I'm still flying 747s, Chris, but I'm now uh, working for a cargo company. I'm the chief pilot for a company called Longtail Aviation um, because there's a huge demand for, for, for cargo. Mm. Passenger planes fly passengers obviously but in the hold there are tons of cargo now with those aircraft on the ground effectively not flying that cargo still needs to be moved around um, and so I saw the writing on the wall in the summer and I, I took the hopefully sensible decision to to move on and and so I'm still very busy but I, I do really feel for um, for the avian for the industry as a whole it's it's been decimated in the last six months yeah very very old friend of mine Colette hello if you if you ever get to watch this she was with Virgin for best part well I bet I better not say how many how many years but you know <laughs> since school basically she's she'd um been a what's the right terminology these days that we used to say hostess and you don't say that anymore do you cabin crew student cabin crew. I'm sorry yep. apologies everybody that's <laughs> that's not me being um um inappropriate it's, my brain doesn't work sometimes cabin crew is good cabin crew yeah so she was cabin crew and absolutely loved it yeah loved it and to see that that um you know all these folks are getting laid off yeah it's really sad really sad yes so how is it then how's it flying a, i mean it's a totally different experience from what you're used to it really is Chris, it really is. Um, I remember the first time I was shown into the, the cockpit of one. And of course, you've seen it. It's just buttons and switches everywhere. You just think, how on earth am I going to know what they do? But of course you do. You learn. You go into the simulator again and again and practice checks and emergencies. And it's all very procedurally driven. It's very, very good. Uh, standard operating procedures, which I'm sure you've heard of in in marines it's the same you know we we do it all the time um but as an airplane it's fantastic the 747 i think is the last airplane that certainly boeing threw money at when they built it so it's solid it's got a lot of redundancy built in um for the cabin crew the galleys the kitchens are big purpose built um and the cockpit's actually quite small although it's really it's really cozy in there it does the job uh, it's a great aeroplane. It's really, it, it's a thrill to fly it. I still, when I walk around doing the external check, we have, we have a, a walk around outside, you still look up and, in awe and think, wow, this is a big machine. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Um, you, you still appreciate the, yeah. the, the majesty in it. Yeah, definitely. It's funny, though, when you look into an airline cockpit, um, airline cockpit airliners cockpit yeah yeah it it's still very quite some of them are quite antiquated aren't they it, mm. it almost looks like a blooming dentist chair in there or something yeah tiny yeah. and there's um you kind of have this image that you're going to look in there's going to be some sort of like palatial couch and and uh, <laughs> you know, leather leather clad steering steering column <laughs> or, or, or whatever and it but it's very it's it almost sort of vintage is maybe the word yeah the 747 certainly is 80s technology, so you'd um, it does look old now compared to some of the more modern 
Boeing's and Airbus's, um, but it's still a thrill to fly. It's an iconic airplane. Certainly some of the bigger airlines have decided to ground them for, for cost reasons, really. I mean, it's an expensive airplane to run. And I think with the passenger numbers as low as they are, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but for me, I'm still lucky enough to be able to hop into one every every so often with the cargo. Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's a great airplane, it really is. Yeah, so there's three leaps there that when you're a fast jet pilot, it you you're on the money, aren't you? You know, you're on the literally on the controls. And but when you go to an airliner, it's more systems based, isn't it? You're yes. pushing buttons to control systems which ultimately fly the plane, but you've always got the the option to take control in an emergency, right? Yeah, so we always do the, the takeoff is always hand flown, either the captain or the first off. So we usually take it in turns. Um, and I would say 99% of the landings as well, because we need the practice. So we take the, you take off about five minutes into the flight, you put the autopilot in, because the autopilot flies the airplane really accurately. Um, and it's tiring, you know, if you're going to go across the Atlantic, you don't want to be sat there like this for, for seven hours. So it flies it very accurately for you. And you just input, as you said, you know, on the on the control panel um, or through the flight management computer, you make some changes. So it will fly you there. And then on the approach into landing into New York or Boston, wherever you're going, you take the autopilot out and you do do the landing. And the only time we wouldn't do that is if it's really foggy and the aircraft can land itself in in fog, which is nice to know. But um, that's the only time we would let the airplane land itself. Other than that, we always do the landing. Your heart must be a bit like that in fog then. Thinking... Well, do you know what? It's, it's really strange putting your faith in the airplane mm. and you can't see, you literally can't see anything until you feel the wheels touch down and then you start to see the runway lights go past. Uh, yeah, it's quite a nerve. First time you do it, it's quite unnerving. Mm, I bet. I had one recently. It was... Um, Landed at Heathrow in, in the fog. The aircraft did a great job, stopped on the runway, but it was so foggy we couldn't see to taxi off the runway. I had to get a, a follow me car to come and park by the nose wheel and we followed him off the runway. It was just, the visibility was so bad. You don't, you don't want to be stuck on a runway too long, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What's it called when you slip the plane slightly sideways, like sort of crabbing it in? What, what, what's the... Um, yeah, side slip yeah side slip yeah what i used to do that when i when i came up to land on the am i using the right term injury land on the runway yeah yeah so when i came up to land on the runway, if i was too high i used to give it was it left rudder and right stick something yeah. like that yeah you can get rid of the height by doing that yeah. you can't really do that in a 747 but you can in a light aircraft well, the reason I mention it is I saw one of these air crash investigation program or that that type of show, and the pilot actually did. He he'd lost all um all the sort of systems, all the he was down to basically he had to fly the plane himself. Yeah. And he had one shot at hitting this this runway. That was it. And yeah. He 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 crabbed an airliner in. It was um Okay. Yeah, it was. It, oof. Yeah, it's not a technique we use very often. No. <laughs> no. For people listening, it's it's this configuration you can put an aircraft in where it will lose height really quickly because of the the airflow, obviously, over the wings. Um, and so, if you come into an air to land and you're way too high. You can quickly just do this opposite thing, and you can lose a lot, lot of height, and and then you level off again, and 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 you're 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 good to go. Is it? Is it? Um, is it better not having a sort of a whole load of people on board when you're flying cargo? It's different, you know. Um, I didn't realise how different it is. I've only been doing this for a few months, but um, in many ways, it's easier. You don't have to keep, keep apologising for being late. You don't have to keep explaining yourself. <laughs> you have to make your own tea, though. That's the bad thing. <laughs> um, but no, it is, it's different. So we fly with two or three pilots, depending on the length of the flight. We have a, a loadmaster, 
can make sure that all the cargo is loaded correctly, you know, um, in terms of dangerous goods or the weight is all distributed evenly. Um, and we have a flight engineer as well who looks after the aircraft when we land. So there's usually five of us there. But um, no, it's really different, actually. It's in many ways, I quite like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, um, what stories have you got from the, your sort of um, passenger side of things? So you must have had a few scare stories and incidents over the years. Do you know what? So when I, when I started doing this, somebody said to me, the airplanes are pretty good. So most of the problems you'll encounter are going to be to do with either cabin crew or passengers. Um, and that's proved the case. That really has. So um, I'll give you an example. And I think this is a true story, Chris. So on one of the flights, um, there was a call to the, to the flight crew to say that one of the passengers was, was really ill right down the back of the airplane. He's quite an old guy and he, he was really not in a good way. Now we can call on a satellite phone and get medical advice, which we did. And um, the, um, we, we passed this on to the steward who was looking after this passenger. Um, and he called back and he said, I, th I think the guy's died. So, so this was in the days of when we had a flight engineer on board the passenger airplane as well. So we sent the flight engineer back and um, he confirmed that this guy had he sort of died in his seat. He was quite old and I think he'd had underlying issues. So they thought, well, out of respect, rather than just leave him in his, this seat, there was a little bit more room towards the front of the aircraft. So they thought, well, let's go and take him there and um, out of the way of everybody else. So the steward and the flight engineer, they were sort of trying to maneuver this, uh, this poor chap through the, through the, through the uh, cabin so they, they got him through the economy cabin and the halfway through the club cabin, they could see quite a few people were looking around, obviously getting a little bit disturbed about it. So the flight engineer, they stopped, he looked around and said, did anybody else have the fish? <laughs> yeah, I could imagine all the all the veterans on the plane would have been laughing at that one and everyone else would have been. Yeah. And one of the things we always get asked is, you know, how do you get an upgrade? So people try all sorts of things uh, to get an upgrade. Um, and there was, uh, there was one occasion, I thought the cabin crew dealt with this brilliantly. So it's quite a large Jamaican lady sat in her seat and, and next to her was this quite sort of obnoxious businessman in his sort of shiny suit. And he called the cabin crew over and said, you know, I can't sit next to this, this woman. Um, and he started having a moan about her. And so the cabin crew said, leave it with me, sir. I'll just go and find out. We'll, we'll sort something out. So she disappeared off for a couple of minutes. And she came back and she said, it's all been sorted, sir. Madam, if you'd like to come with me, we've got a nice seat for you. So he took the, took the uh, Jamaican lady off and gave her a nice seat and just left him where, he's, where he was. But you know what? People try all sorts of, of things to get an upgrade. They yeah. really do. Andy, how do you manage alcohol? Um, I love it. <laughs> but I mention it because it's been such a factor in my my whole, yes. <clears throat> my whole adult life. Yeah. Um, I really had to manage it, let's say. Yeah. yeah. And there's been many times where I failed miserably to, to manage it. Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't in charge of an airliner full of yes. people, right, with very strict rules. Yeah. And the threat of even if someone got a whiff of it on my breath, that's my whole career is down a pan, right? Yeah. And yeah. quite 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 rightly so. How what how does it work then? Because I'm just gonna throw a few things out here. So yeah. I mean, veterans like yourself, mass, you know come from the military where drinking culture and subsequently alcoholism is, is a real factor for, for a significant mm. percentage. Yeah. You've got the fact that as a pilot, you're sat around waiting an awful lot of the time, whether that be hotel rooms or departure lounges or, or crew, crew lounges, this kind of thing. Yeah. You're also in that environment where alcohol is always around you whether it's the bar or the duty-free shop or the, the hotel while you're waiting to you know for your 
for your taxi or whatever. Yeah. yeah. What, what what can you enlighten us as to sort of? Yeah, that? that's a really good question, Chris. And because you know, rather like you, the military, as you said, is quite a hard. It's a hard. Well, it was in those days, wasn't it? It's was quite a hard drinking, hard playing environment. Mm. Um, and yeah, it has to change when you when you join an airline because you're absolutely right. Your job and therefore your career, your livelihood is on the line. So, and I, you know, I love a glass of, of wine uh, along with, with the best of my friends, really. And um, the way we do it, I suppose, it's you just have to be self-disciplined. We do have the rules. The rules are there for a reason. Um, of course, there are people who have in the past broken the rules and there are quite a few people, you know, who've been found out. But most people and all the people I've flown with are, are sensible. So if we'll go, well, I'll give you an example. We go perhaps fly to New York one day. We'll have that night and the next day in New York before flying back. So we'll go out for a, for a bite to eat, maybe have a couple of beers, but that will be it. Uh, and you know then that you've got at least 12 hours before you're due to report for uh, for flying. Um, and as I say, you have to be self-disciplined and all the guys I've flown with have all been really good about that. They'd even start to say, okay, yeah, we need to stop. Um, and it's in moderation before that too, you know, you just can't go and get, get hammered and then fly back the next day. It just, it just doesn't work like that. You just can't do it. That's the thing about getting older though, isn't it? When you're, when you're in your twenties and, and again, you're in the forces. Yeah. You, it is that cliche. You go out yeah. and get hammered in the evening and then you're up for a run at, at eight o'clock the next morning or yeah. you're on guard duty or you're, you know, you're this, you're very often carrying live, you know, weapon and ammunition. Mm -hmm. Now, even just doing the sort of stuff I do now, my writing and my podcasting and stuff, gosh, I realise I can't even really have a beer the night before now. Yeah, yeah. It, it just it just puts me off for the whole of the next day. Yeah. You know, I don't, en I stop enjoying what I do, right? Yeah. Well, um, that's an age thing then, because that's the same with me. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? That I would imagine even as a Red Arrows pilot, so the best of the best, you could go out and I'm not suggesting people do, but maybe have eight beers the night before and, and you're fine the next morning. You're just, you know, good to go. But as you get older, it's, it, it's just different. Yeah. Isn't it? You can't do it, can you? It's just, it's just impossible. And, you know, we get time off um, at home between flights. So that's really when you can have a glass of wine with your dinner or a few beers. And um, yeah, when you're away, you just, just got to be sensible. So it's self-management. Um, and I'm sure there are people, you know, who, who who can't do it, but it's your livelihood, so you, you do. Did it? Um, it always seems funny to me when people go to a country, whether they're just even on a commercial flight, and they go, "Oh yeah, I stopped over in Hong Kong. Yeah, didn't leave the air airport." And I'm like, "Dude, why didn't you just ask the travel company to give you 48 hours?" Yeah. I mean, you've just missed out on one of the, the holy grails of travel locations and yeah. uh, the chance to have an experience. I mean, just two days in hot in Asia is going to blow your mind. Um, how is that as, as, as a pilot and air crew? Do, do people manage that differently? They, they do. And, and the thing is, with the flying I've done, we always get, I would say, a minimum of 24 hours wherever you're going. So... I've talked about the East Coast of America, haven't I? So I mentioned Boston and New York before. So that would be a good example of where you would get 24 hours. Sometimes further afield, you get more, you get a couple of days. So your know, Hong Kong is a good example. We would fly there and have two days off before flying back because of the, you know, the length of the flight, you need that recovery time. So I've actually been really privileged, Chris, to have flown that map behind you um, pretty much all over the world, you know. Um, South America, all over North America, Canada, Africa, Far East, Australia. So it's been a real privilege. I've, I've, I don't know if you, have you seen one of these apps where you can add up the number of countries that you've been to? Yes, um, I did it the other it, day, actually. Did you? Well, I've been, I've been to, um, I think it was something like 75 
countries. And I thought, well, I wonder what that is in terms of how many countries in the world as a percentage. And do you know what? So all that traveling, I thought I must have been to nearly everywhere. It was 26% of the world's countries. So you think there's still, I've still got all that to do. I always tell people I've traveled to over 80 countries, right? But when I added them up the other day, it's 87. Wow. But there is a caveat. Some of those countries are now no longer countries, which ah. might, that might sound crazy <laughs> to people listening. But you've got to remember that Hong Kong, you know, what was Hong Kong? It, it, it was Brit under British rule, but it was part of China. Now yeah. it's now it's under Chinese. I mean, I'd never say that Hong Kong is Britain, you know, or England. Yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, and then you've got places like Macau that was governed by portugal but now is uh, i don't know if they're independent or under china what i'm saying is places change and oh absolutely yeah 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 but like yeah. you said one of the percentage it gives me on TripAdvisor is i think it says you've seen 38 percent of the world which is and i would be the first to argue no i've probably seen about 0.03 percent of the yeah. world <laughs> yeah. it, it's a big place but that brings me on to something um, as a pilot, I'm fascinated to ask you this. Are you familiar with the flat earth movement? I've, I have heard of it, yes, yeah. Okay. Tell me more. Oh, okay, first of all, I just wanna start. I welcome anybody questioning authority and the status quo. I think, the last 20 years have shown us that what you see in the media isn't really the, the, uh, the, the truth of what goes on in the world. But I also think you, you have to be aware of when people are putting misinformation out there. And one of the theories out at the moment is the world isn't a globe. The world is a plane. So it's, it's flat, hence the term flat earth. Mm -hmm. And that Antarctica is not a continent. So for people like myself and, and my colleagues that have, some of whom have skied across Antarctica, right, who would say, no, it's a continent. When you get there, there's rocks, right? It's, it's a landmass. The flat earth argument is that, no, we, we've somehow been duped and that the Antarctica is just a ring of, an ice wall effectively around the edge of the planet to, I'm guessing, keep the water in. And I'll be the first to say that the, the, some of the arguments that are put out seem very convincing, you know, when they talk about water on the surface of a ball and why doesn't it fly off the earth and da 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 da. But bringing it back to the, the pilot um, connection, it's very often it said, why don't planes fly over Antarctica and that is given as a reason why the earth is most likely flat I would say off the top of my head have you seen the size of it what if you had to crash land or or you had an emergency on but there's I mean Antarctica it's got to be what the size of North America or or, or, or that thereabouts right yeah um I don't know. I, 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 well, we do, go, we do go pretty close to the Arctic, certainly the routes I do, not necessarily the Antarctic. But, for example, if we fly to the west coast of America, the map behind you, if you drew a line between the UK and the west coast, it would be straight across the Atlantic to, you know, I don't know, Seattle or somewhere like that. But the actual, on a globe, when you look at it, takes you up towards we would go up to from from london you probably head up to scotland iceland halfway up greenland and that's the shortest route on a circle on a globe so that's there's there's your proof to start with really um if you have a look at a globe and draw a line on a globe that, that's where it'll take you so we go pretty close to the arctic on a trip to the west coast of america mm -hmm. um there aren't many flights that go right down south, you know, from the southern tip of South America, say to Australia, uh, across the Pacific, but they would probably go quite a long way south as well, I would suggest. So, so yeah, I do go way up into the Arctic Circle when I'm doing routes like that, and routes from, you know, the UK to 
I don't know, let's say somewhere in China, so even Hong Kong, but perhaps Shanghai or Beijing, we go way up over, um, over Russia, way up over Siberia, and that is the shortest Great Circle route. Yeah, that's it. Um, there you go. Yes. <laughs> well, there, there, there will be, and I, I'm not here to judge folks, but I'm just saying there will be people that will argue with what you just said, and... Yeah. And they will sound really con convincing. Um, it's just kind of funny when, like I said, I've been to Antarctica, so no one can tell me it's not a continent, yeah. right? Yeah. You, 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 like, I mean, and someone suggested I was on like a movie set that had been built by these uh, ultra rich, um, you know, psychopaths that run the planet. <laughs> but. <laughs> Even the Antarctic Peninsula alone is about eight times the size of Great Britain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly eight times the size of England. It would be one hell of a movie set. Right? But yeah, there we go. There we go. Well, Andy, that, oh, the one last thing I wanted to ask you. Sure. I saw a really fascinating video. Uh, I think it was on YouTube not long back. And it was somehow suggesting that the amount of fuel that an airliner uses isn't as much as we've been led to believe. That once it's up there and the, the turbojets are doing their, their thing, I won't pretend I know that they, they use very little fuel to keep them going, and, but it's more the influx of air that cleverly creates the power. And I'm probably- Yeah, I mean, it uses- it's like any engine, so it'll use more, like a car when you've got your foot down, it's going to use more fuel. So on takeoff and climb, it does, but engines, that certainly newer engines with green technology, once the aircraft's in the cruise, you're absolutely right. They are using far less fuel than some of the older engines. So technology is moving on and, and there's some, some really good advances actually with um, solar energy, electric energy, but at the moment, even the, you know, the normal, um, diesel powered engines are still relatively economical. The problem that the 747 has, it's got four of them. So it does use more, more fuel than, than, you know, your more modern airplanes. But no, that's true. In the cruise, they do use, they do use less, absolutely. And one final thing, I believe you, you speak on cruise ships. Is that right? I do, I do. They're called insight lectures on cruise ships. So I'll, I'll go and talk about my, Red Arrow's experience, my airline experience, and various history type uh, subjects, all to do with aviation, of course, um, to try and enlighten the passengers when we eventually get back to, to cruise, cruising again, because of course that's all been uh, decimated as well. Yes, although ironically, you, you are kind of quarantined when you're on a ship. <laughs> that's right, you are, <laughs> yeah. What, what's the deal there then? Do they, do they pay for your whole but I mean, pay, obviously you're, you're employed, but yes. do you get the whole cruise or do you just join them at a certain location? Well, I can do either. I tend to, to do the whole cruise. So, uh, and I do the talks when the ship is at sea. So of course, when you're in port, everybody goes off on various trips and things like that. So um, when the ship's at sea, I'll, I'll do a talk. And there are usually two or three guest speakers on board. So maybe on a transatlantic crossing, you know, you'd be talking each day. So you need to have a library of talks. I've got about 10, 10 different talks that I do. So I might see you on a cruise ship one day, Chris. I was gonna say, if you, um, if you want someone to do your PowerPoint slides, I'm your man. No, I was thinking, but you'd be doing a talk as well. Mate, they won't ask people like me. Um, I think my, uh, my true life story is too... <laughs> it's, it's too out there. <laughs> yes, you know, I talk about reality and the sad fact of life is 98% of people don't want to live in reality. And it's a shame because it means mental health just gets yeah. shoved aside. Understanding addiction gets shoved aside. And they're both so important, aren't they? And I think, you know what, even at the end of all this, we're going to see that um, they're so much more important than we thought. Yeah, well, you know, we're all going to lose loved ones to mental health issues in, in yeah. years to come, especially yeah. probably off the back of what's going on now. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, but yeah, but uh, I don't know if there's any cruise ships out there. <laughs> <laughs> They're all parked up in um, 
Pool Harbour at the moment, I think. Yes, my gosh. I love being, I love being on a, I haven't really done so much cruises as in like a holiday. Yes. Um, but I did go on an expedition ship to, as I said, to Antarctica. Yeah. Which is technically like a, you know, it's very f- excellent service on board. It was like being on a sort of cruise. Yes. Um, and we sailed back from Norway on a cruise liner. Okay. And I've done things like, for example, get a ferry from Sweden to Iceland, which is a two, maybe a two and a half day crossing. Yeah. And again, that's kind of set. Up, I, I don't know where where you cross the line from being a ferry to a cruise. Yeah. But yeah. It gives you a flavour of it, doesn't it? Definitely. I love it, though, Andy. Yeah. I really... I, th- I think it's because when you step foot step foot on that ship, mm. all your stresses you just leave behind you. Yeah, I, I agree, and that's your home. You can't get off. You've just got to make the most of of where you are, and it's great. I love it too. Yes. <laughs> well, I've certainly loved our talk, mate. Thank you ever so much. Hey, it's a pleasure. Um, just my God, I'm just so lucky to meet people such as yourself. Mm. Um, massively um good luck with everything thanks chris where's the best place to people to book you to speak i've got my own website actually which is called uh, plainspeaking.co just .co not .com um and i'm also with an agent called champion speakers so either of those so you can contact me at um, andy okay. at- I'm just scrolling this down not that i couldn't find no, it uh, on the internet search but um plain but speaking i'll put these below our video and on itunes yeah that's great thank you no problem so thank you again andy just just stay on the line so i can thank you properly to everybody at home um big love to you all look after yourselves thank you for tuning in again if you could like and subscribe that would be wonderful or set the notification bell is something i've never asked anyone to do until today so you're it's a milestone in the bought the t-shirt podcast history (laughs) it's such exciting way that i live (laughs) hit the bell (laughs) take care everyone hello friend i hope this finds you well my name's chris rule i'm a former royal marines commando and i fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.